Okay, so I wanted to mention too that we have 16 teeth on the top, 16 teeth on the bottom. We have four types of teeth. Um, I forgot to mention we were talking about origins of life. And one thing that I wanted to talk about was, you know, I, I want to remind you that science and religion aren't so separate. Uh, science is first quadrant, religion is second quadrant. So we have um, uh, one a popular theory in the origins of life of where life originated is that life originated from clay. Um, and what's fascinating is in cultures throughout the world, the origins myths, um, a lot of origin myths start off with humans coming from clay. So that an example of that would be in Genesis, in, um, in the, the Jewish myth, where um, Adam and Eve are brought out of, out from the clay from, um, uh, and <clears throat> the interesting thing about clay is it's made of silicone. Remember I described, I discussed how silicone has the four valence electrons and it makes, it looks like the quadrant with the four valence electrons going out, the two from on the side, two, uh, one up and down. <clears throat> um, I wanted to mention too, we were discussing sociology, I forgot to talk about this one, um, this, this one thing where sociologists say that there's four distinct stages of social development, social levels that um, cultures go through. And once again, these are like phase transitions or phase, phase shifts. They're, the cultures start off in one stage and then they move to the next stage and it's it's obvious that they move to the next stage and it, they, they jump from one stage to the other. But there's four stages. <clears throat> the first stage is the band, is band. So these are, these are families and the social order is maintained usually through gossip. Um, this is kind of first question oriented. Then they move to tribes. I guess tribes gets a little bigger, maybe, um, you know, adds more people to it. Um, but it's very family oriented and in tribes it's kind of more peaceful. There's, there, there is some fighting that goes on, but it tends to be more peaceful. And uh, sociologists, biologists would argue that the reason for this is because uh, tribes are made up of families that are related to each other, closely related to each other. And genetics would, um, would predict that they wouldn't be killing, uh, you know, members of a tribe would not want to kill each other so much because they're related to each other. And it's, it's, it's seen as a bad thing if people in the same tribe are killing each other. <clears throat> then societies move and they say that this is like, a, this is the big transition from the first, second quadrant. Now they move to the third quadrant. They move to um, chiefdoms and Sociologists say that they, when they look at um, when they look at how the Israelites moved into having kings, and they, they, they say that this was the the stage into uh, moving into chiefdoms. So they say that David was a a, a good example of this. King David, um, he's a good example of a, a leader, a king of a chiefdom. And what they note with about King David is. They say that King David was not so genetically related to the Israelite people because he had a mother who, or he had ancestors who were Gentiles. And even people thought that, well, Ruth was one of the Gentile ancestors. And people thought that David was an illegitimate son. This is why, or, you know, this is what the rabbi was discussing with me, that um, King David when uh when when they were tr when uh, i think it was Nathan the I, f I forget what prophet it what it was i forget the name i forget names but i think it was the prophet maybe it was Nathan i forget his name but he goes and he has to try to pick you know god tells him to pick um somebody f um 
from David's family, uh, which ends up being David, to be the king of the Israelites. And um, so he goes, and, and then the, the, David's father has, shows all of David's other sons first. And he says, you know, these, these are all my sons, and, you know, you can choose whatever one you want. But the prophet, um, I, for, I forget what his name was, but I'm just going to say Nathan. But the prophet says, you know, no, no, none of these are the right one. And then he looks at David. And then he picks David. The reason why he picked David was because David was seen as illegitimate. I guess he had um, red hair. And he was, you know, people thought that this, this he might have been an illegitimate son. Um, and, you know, perhaps he wasn't so related to the, the dad. Um, and perhaps he wasn't, you know, necessar you know, necessarily so related to the Israelites. This is this is a hypothesis. <clears throat> so they picked King David to rule over the Israelites. Well, anyways, going back to the idea of chiefdoms, what what sociologists say about chiefdoms that separates that uh, the thing about chiefdoms that that is special that separates them from um, from the tribes is that the kings and the chiefdoms they are. <clears throat> It's okay for them to kill their subjects. There's a lot more murder. There's a lot more, um, you, know, you know, threats, things in order to maintain order. And usually these kings are good. Um, they're skilled. They have special. They have special skills. They are seen as you know special figures. These kings, but. The idea with King David is he wasn't so related to the people, so it's okay for him to start killing um, the subjects because he's not so genetically related. Okay, but there's other examples of this. So once people get into the chiefdoms, the kings start to say that they are not necessarily related to their subjects. They start to say that they are related, that their fathers are actually gods. And this is sociologists, biologists say that this makes sense in terms of genetics. So now they're saying that they're not so related to the people. If you're related to a god, now it's okay that you kill people if you need to. Because if you're no longer in the tribal stage where you're a family, now you're related to a god. It's okay to kill people if you need to in order to maintain order. So remember, the third quadrant, we're in the chiefdoms. The third quadrant, there's a lot more violence. It's seen as more bad. Then there's the next stage where... You move into states, and this incorporates different chiefdoms, I guess, and it's 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 different than the chiefdoms. <clears throat> Once again, there's a possible fifth st stage. They call it, I think, empires, but sociologists say that really there's only four stages. Some people suggest that there could be a fifth stage, but once again, the fifth stage always seems unnecessary. But there is there is a suggestion that there's a fifth stage. Um. All right, so let me continue. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, oh, and another thing I wanted to mention was Carl Jung. Um, he described that. You remember Carl Jung was the he was a contemporary of Freud. Uh, he studied different cultures around the world, and he noticed that a lot of these cultures had what are called mandalas, and these mandalas had four parts to them. And he noted that a lot of these cultures had four gods, four primary gods. An example would be the Greeks. The Greek pantheon originated with four, you know, primary god figures, and that's where everything derived from. So once again, we have the quadrant; everything derives from from that. Um, so when Jung was looking at Christianity, he noticed, well, Christianity was teaching the Trinity. It was only teaching three gods, or actually they said three gods in one, so it was actually one god, but they, they had only three aspects. And he thought, well, maybe the reason why Christianity, why, Chris, uh, why there's so much violence in Christianity, you see, you know, the ca Catholic Church separated from the Protestants and all this fighting and them finding other other religions and you see all this he thought that the maybe a part of this was the fact that 
um, they were unbalanced because they forgot the fourth part of the of of the Godhead, I guess is what he might call it. So he thought that there should be four aspects to uh, the God, like in um, like in other cultures. So he suggested that there should be the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, and the fourth part should be the Mother Mary. Or he said that maybe the fourth part should be the devil. He noticed how Christians often would, um, you know, kind of leave those out. But he thought that there should be a fourth, this fourth aspect. And he, he noted that a lot of these cultures had a mother goddess. Um, and the Christian culture kind of um, devalued the mother Mary. So he thought maybe the fourth part should be the mother Mary. Then he noted that he, the Catholic Church has already kind of done that. The Catholic Church kind of worships the mother Mary in a way. Not necessarily worships, but they look highly upon her. So um, that's just an interesting note about Carl Jung <clears throat> and once again it fits the quadrant <clears throat> um, so we have Buddhism a lot of vegetarians uh, seems first quadrant oriented Christianity faith it's about faith belief um, you know the Buddhists are sensitive perceptive responsive responsible aware um, and then you have Islam in Islam you have to do things you have to pray five times a day you have th Things that you're required to do in order to be a good person. So Islam is more of a doing religion um, So this is a third quadrant and then you have Hinduism uh, We got the contemplation passion, you know Hindus are often you know meditating they It's more philosophical more of a philosophical religion and it's the fourth quadrant. <clears throat> These are the four world religions. Um, now, let me discuss Christianity a little bit. I want to start off by discussing how historians look at Christianity. So, let's first discuss the four Gospels. We have Mark. Um. Matthew, Luke, and John. They say historians say that Mark was written first, Matthew was written second, Luke was written third, John was written fourth, and there's the possible fifth gospel of Thomas, but once again it's kind of pushed pushed out. It's unnecessary, but this this is one that was kind of written close to John, but it's a lot different in that it is a Gnostic gospel. So hopefully we're going to talk about that a little bit, what that means. But <clears throat> it was it was not put in the canon <coughs> of scriptures that <coughs> Christians should be um, reading because it is a little. It's a lot different than the first four. Um, John is a lot different than these first three. Um, historians think that these first three are very similar. They call, I think they call them maybe the Synoptic Gospels, and John it has a different name. Maybe it's like Coptic, I forget. But they say the first three are very similar, and then John is a lot different. So once again, we have the duality, Mark, Matthew, the triad, Mark, Matthew, Luke. John is the fourth one, the quadrat. It's different. But it also contains elements that all these other ones have. Another interesting thing is there's the four source hypothesis. So they say that these four gospels came from four sources, original sources. I, I can't really describe to you exactly how they come up with that. But um, historians think that this is, you know, a very valid theory. And, and this is the dominant theory that there's four sources that these gospels came out of. Um, once again, we have the quadrant. <clears throat> um, also, one, one thing I want to mention, too, is. Even the Pentateuch, the first uh, books written by Moses, the first five books of the Torah, which would be Genesis, um, Exodus, Leviticus, um, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, those historic, historians thought that those were written by four people, four separate people, and they uh, called this theory the JEPD theory. So the J was the um, Y, H, W, and H um, 
reading, which means that whenever they, whenever this author would refer to God, he referred to him as Y, H, W, and H, which is the tetragrammaton, the four-letter word of God, the four-letter name of God. Um, I want to mention, too, the, the Greeks also had, um, of, well, the, the Jews, they looked at this four-letter name of God as the most holy name that there is, the four-letter name, Y, H, W, and H. <clears throat> You're not supposed to say them all together. You can't even say that out loud because it's so holy. Um, the Greeks also had, a, the, uh, the Pythagoreans had what, who, who were Greek philosophers, worshipped what is called the Tetracist. And the Tetracist was based off of tessellations of the triangle. So you have this triangle and what the tessellations are is triangles around the triangle that are the same triangle and it creates this. So you have four triangles and this is a Tetracist. And, and there's another thing that they worshipped where you have the one dot, you have two dots, the three dots, and then you have the four dots. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten dots. This is it's funny because this is what you bull with, right? When you're bowling you this is this is the way it's set up. But they would worship this. You have the four rows of dots. They thought that these were very holy, these symbols. Anyways, back to um, the JPD hypothesis. So J was the Y H W H. They, that's how they referred to God. E was Elohim. They referred to God as Elohim. P is the priestly. They thought that the priests wrote this one. And D is the Deuteron Deuteronomic source. And it's kind of different than the other three. Once again, same type of thing. But a lot of people say, no, it wasn't written by four people. It seems like it was written by one person. Why? Because there's what is called a chiasmatic structure. What a chiasm is, is a crossing. So I can't really describe it right now. <clears throat> but what it basically means is um, the way that the structure is of the writing, it, it forms um, a chiasma. I don't really want to describe it that well because I can't really describe it that well right now. But um, it's called chiasmatic. There's a crossing that goes throughout the whole J, E, P, D, J, E, P, and D, which makes it seem like one person wrote them all. Even though they all these seem separate, it seems like one person wrote the, these what the historians thought were four people were four sources of um, of the Pentateuch. Now I also want to say that the the Pentateuch itself follows the form. So we have Genesis. This is individuals, you know, kind of trying to find themselves, right? Then you have Exodus, where you have the family. You know, the Israelites get together. You it's more family oriented. Then you have Leviticus where you're doing things. These are the laws and they start to do things. Then you have Numbers. Numbers is all about death. And it's also um, about, you know, the Israelites doing things. But there's a lot of death in Numbers. Um, and then you have Deuteronomy, which is kind of the transcendent one. Um, the fifth one. Okay, so but back to Matthew, Mark or Mark, Matthew, Luke and John, because this is the order that historians think they are written. <clears throat> historians agree on one thing they say or pretty much all historians agree on the fact that they this is what they think they think it they think that Jesus was a historical figure this is what historians think I'm just saying what the historians think so I think Jesus was a historian a historical figure and that they say that it, it's certain that he was a uh, Jewish and that he was a rabbi and that he um, and they think that now there, now there, there's a little debate on this, but most of them think that he was a messianic Jew who was talking about it. Pretty much most all of them say that he was a messianic Jew who was talking about the end of this age and the coming of a new age. Um, this idea of this new age, this, this eternal kingdom, this messianic age, uh, is, is, in, is in a lot of cultures, the Greeks, they talked about that there's the Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age, and then they talked about a possible Fifth Age, or, you know, or a lot of different cultures talk about this, the same, the same pattern, um, and so D the prophet Daniel talked about, um, the prophet Daniel was a, a prophet in um, the quote-unquote Old Testament, so the Old Testament is what um, the Jews follow. Um, it's the Torah, the Tanakh, um, 
but this is all the books that the Jews follow. The New Testament is the books that the Christians follow. The Christians follow the Old Testament and the New Testament. So the prophet Daniel of the Old Testament, he <coughs> said that there's, um, he used a metaphor of a, a statue, but he says that there's a, the golden age, the, there's the bronze, the silver, and then the iron. And then he says that there's the iron and clay. So remember, the fourth and fifth are always connected. So the iron and clay are mixed together. And the, this fifth stage is the eternal kingdom. It's a, it's a, it's a perfect kingdom. And this is the eternal, kind of like what he describes as a messianic kingdom. Um, it's funny, too, because when Daniel would describe, he had other visions. All his visions take the... They, they take the form. So he'll, he'll talk about, he sees four beasts and, you know, each beast builds on the, the, the other one. And then the fourth beast is always way different than the other ones, but it has aspects of all the other ones. So you see the form throughout the whole Bible. I'm not, I'll, I'll just give a few more examples really quick so you can see what I mean. So for instance, Noah, you, there's the flood and Noah, um, lets out three Three, uh, I think it was three, three times he lets out a raven, and then finally he lets out a dove the fourth time um, to see if the land, if, if they're on land, and then the dove doesn't come back. So we have the the form with that. Um, Ezekiel, he walks into the water, and he first he walks in, and it says like he was ankle deep, then knee deep, then waist deep, and then his whole body, the four parts. Um, Ezekiel, when he sees the Merkaba or the chariot in the sky. He describes there's four faces and there's four this and four this and he's describing he's describing the quadrants. Um, these aren't just random my mystical experiences. Um, Elijah he goes up onto the mountain and he you know he 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 sees I, I think he sees like four different types of elements. He first I, I can't I don't remember exact order but you know if he feels an earthquake he feels fire then he. You know, maybe it was water. I forget exactly. But there's th the first three. And then the fourth one, he f he heard a whisper of wind and it was from God. <clears throat> so we have the quadrant. And it's interesting because Elijah had this experience after he was kind of kicked out of the community. Um, these prophets always have these, uh, often have these experiences when they're kicked out of the community. They're not belonging anymore. Remember, you're, when you're not belonging you you're forced to you know think emote do dream and then you end up ultimately being forced to contemplate have passion flow and then know but it's good sometimes not to belong so elijah he's not belonging he goes onto the mountaintop and he has this experience as um isaiah has the same type of experience where he experiences the four things um Another example is um, Job. Job is, you know, a lot of people know about the story of Job. He's, he's a faithful guy. You know, things are going good for him. Uh, next thing he knows, Satan, Satan is called the accuser. He shakes things up a little bit. Satan and God are seen as kind of like, they're kind of buddy. Satan's like, hey, God, you know, I, 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 I bet you that, you know, um, this guy, Job, I bet you he's not going to follow you if, you know, things start going bad for him. And God's like, okay, you're on. I bet you he'll still, uh, he'll still believe in me and obey me and, you know, have faith in me. So then uh, Satan was like, okay, okay, bet's on. And Satan's described as a wanderer. So Satan is a wanderer, kind of like a flower, right? So um, Satan tests Job. Job loses everything. And there's four people who end up talking to Job. He has four comforters. The first three comfort him, and then the fourth one comes later, and he kind of summarizes the first three. So we have the quadrant again. And then finally, you know, but Job is starting to question. He's starting to say, you know, I did nothing wrong. I've been good this whole time. And then finally the fifth, God, comes to him. He says, hey, Job, don't you realize that I'm responsible for all things? And, it does, you know, don't question me. Pretty much. I forget what he says exactly, but he says, I'm responsible for everything. It's all, you know, whatever I do is just. So that's, whatever I do is just the way it is. It's perfect the way, the way it is. Um, I'm responsible for all things. And then Job is like, okay, you know, I believe you. 
I mean, he says, he says so he, he, went, he went to questioning things. He, Job started to think a little bit. Um, but then in the end, it's kind of the monomyth. Job goes through a lot of struggle. He goes through the struggle, but then in the end, he's rewarded with more than he had at the beginning. So at the beginning, he had, you know, a family. He had a lot of land. And then uh, he gets it all taken away after Satan does the bet. And then, but then in the end, after he goes through all this stuff, he ends up with more than he had in the beginning. This is a common thing. A lot of people don't realize that. They think that Job just was screwed in the end. But no, Job ended up with more in the end than he had at the beginning. And it was good that he went through this struggle. <clears throat> so in that case, people would say, you know, Satan shaking up Job was not necessarily such a bad thing. It was good that Satan shook him up. Uh, Job ended up learning more out of it. He ended up gaining knowledge. Now he knows God. Um, okay, I just wanted to go over those really quick. So back to the Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. <clears throat> uh, these are all stories in the Bible. So these are, these are the Gospels, the four Gospels. <clears throat> uh, historians say that Jesus was a Messianic Jewish prophet. Um, they say that he... This is, this is what the, a lot of them hypothesize. So Jesus was crucified on Passover. Well, it turns out that Passover was the time of the year that the Romans were most afraid of the Jews. Why is that? Because what does Passover commemorate? Passover commemorated the Jews' exodus from Egypt. The Jews were captives according to their story. Um, archaeological evidence kind of indicates, kind of doesn't indicate certain things. There doesn't seem to be too much archaeological evidence of this. But let's, for the sake of this, just say that, it, that it's true. That uh, the Jews were captives in Egypt. And then they, uh, they left Egypt. Um, they were freed from Egypt, from their captors. And the Passover was commemorating their, their exodus from Egypt when they were freed from the Egyptians. So why were the Romans afraid of this? Well, the Romans were the modern Egyptians. The Romans were the modern people who were keeping, who, who had their power over the Jews. Um, so every Passover, there would be, there's, there's a fear that the Jews might want to, you know, start a rebellion because they're commemorating their exodus from Egypt. Now they might want to, you know, take over, you know, start a rebellion trying to break out of Roman authority so this is when the Romans would you know they, they would start to step up their security around Passover time well the historians say that it makes sense that this was the time that Jesus um, that they say in the Gospels that Jesus was taken um, taken by the Romans and crucified because Jesus was a messianic Jewish prophet he was saying, there's going to be a time when the Roman rule is over. And when there's, you know, there's a, the eternal kingdom, the kingdom of God is established on earth. And this is what they say. The historians say that Jesus did not, the evidence, the way that they, that they do it, I'm not going to get into the specifics, but the way that they study it, they say the evidence seems to indicate that Jesus does not, is not describing heaven, at, uh, talking about a place that you go after you die. Jesus is talking about the establishment of a eternal kingdom on earth, a perfect kingdom on earth, um, the kingdom of God. Now, <clears throat> so here's, here's a Jewish prophet saying, you know, Roman rule is going to be destroyed and there's going to be a eternal kingdom. And he's, you know, perhaps, and people are starting to think, okay, this guy is the Messiah. What does the Messiah mean? Messiah means the anointed one. Messiah means the king. <clears throat> I want to make it clear that there, of course, the, the Jews don't see, the Jews see that, believe that there's been a lot of messiahs. Actually, every single king that the Jews have ever had was a messiah. Because a messiah merely means an anointed one. One anointed by God. So every king that the Jews have had was a messiah. Um, every single you know, a lot of the big priests that the Jews had were were anointed of God, so they were called messiahs. But the Jews believed that there would be an ultimate messiah, the one that would bring the eternal kingdom, um, and 
that this this that there is there is a climactic one, a one that's you know bigger than the rest. So here's this guy that, that this is how well historians say here's this guy that people are saying he's the Messiah, he's the king. But look, there's only one king. That king is Caesar. The Romans say there's only one king. That king is Caesar. And here's a guy who there's who, who the people are rallying under saying that he's the king. So they say that most likely the Romans wanted to have Jesus crucified and they always the Romans always during the Passover time would set examples of Jews. They would have Jews crucified. They would have Jews killed because they want to show the Jews, hey, you guys better not try to rebel because this is what we, we have a lot of power over you. We'll kill you. So then they, so they, so the idea is that um, the Jews would also not want the Romans to, or, or, or you know, the, the priests, the priestly Jews would not would, would also not mind the Romans killing Jesus. Why is that? Because the priestly Jews don't want the Romans to send an army and kill all the Jewish people. They don't want a rebellion to happen because they know that they're going to get annihilated. So you know, in a real and they they think you know Jesus is if, if Jesus led an army against the Romans, if he led a rebellion against the Romans, they're, they're not going to stand a chance. So they think you know let, let's quell this. Right now, this is what historians say. This is the historical analysis. Another, some other interesting things uh, that I want to mention about the historical analysis is, um, so at the beginning of the Gospels, it's, it says that <clears throat> there was word that, you know, the Messiah was born. And it says that all the Jews were upset along with King Herod. Or King Herod was upset and all the Jews with him. So, why would it be, why would the Jews be upset that the Messiah was born and, and why would King Herod be upset and why would the Jews be upset with him? This is, this, this is what it says in the Gospels. This is, this is what it says. So the idea that, is, that historians, they, they, they point to the, the truths within this story. They say that King Herod was actually, um, was uh, his, his, King Herod's dad maybe converted to Judaism and King Herod converted to Judaism, but King Herod didn't have any real uh, genetic Jewish ancestry. Um, he was a convert to Judaism. <clears throat> and he's depicted in the Gospels as a kind of a bad guy. But you have to, so, so he's depicted as a bad guy, a nasty guy, but he was a convert to Judaism. <clears throat> and he, and he he often had a lot of pre a lot of the Kohanim killed the Jewish um, rabbis the priests killed because he wanted to consolidate his power and he wants he doesn't want these other people to have power. So why would the Jews be upset if King Herod is upset? Well, King well why would why would King Herod be upset that a Messiah was born? Well, King Herod would be upset because he wants all the power. So it says King Herod was upset and all the Jews were upset with him. Um, the Jews are upset because when King Herod's upset, he starts to kill Jews. And he did this a lot. So, you know, he was called Herod the Great because he made, made, made a lot of great buildings for the Jews. Because, you know, because he was disliked, he had to do things to, you know, make up for that fact. Um, so this is... This is so. So they say, you know, the Jews were upset with King Herod because, you know, King Herod was about to kill Jews at that moment. You know, whenever King Herod's upset, so there's there's a kernel of truth to this story. Um, that the Jews were uh, would be upset if King Herod was upset because King Herod would kill him. Um. So, but the historians don't think that a lot of these events actually happened. So, for instance. The um, the census where Jesus had to go to um, with his parents to uh, I think it was maybe Nazareth I forget where he had to go but he went to this place to for a census and historians say that this census all, all evidence indicates that the census didn't occur but now let me start to describe the difference between the gospel so Mark. It's more talking about the facts. It's more first quadrant oriented, but it has some, you know, 
has some stuff in it. It's it's the first one written. I don't know. It, it just seems first quadrant oriented. Then we have Matthew, the second quadrant. Matthew tries to really emphasize that Jesus is Jewish, and he really tries to 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 illustrate this point very hard. So examples were. He tries to make an analogy between Jesus and Moses. So when Jesus was born, it's described, remember I said that King Herod started to kill all the Jewish, the Jewish uh, males, male sons. Historians actually say that there isn't much evidence that this occurred. But according to the story, um, King Herod tries to start to kill all these Jewish boys because he wants to... You know, make sure that this 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 son, this Messiah, does not come out and you know take his power. Well, this is make this is an analogy with Moses. This is a parallel to Moses because remember when Moses in Egypt, when he was born, the Egyptian Pharaoh tried to have all the uh, Eg uh, the Jewish males of sons killed because. You know, I think that he, he was afraid that there would be a, a son that would overthrow him. Again, we see the irony that King Herod tries, or, or the Egyptian Pharaoh tries to get rid of the son um, that would overthrow him. And then the mother puts Moses in the reed basket. He gets into the Pharaoh's house because the Pharaoh's daughter picks him up from the reed basket. And then that same person that he tried to have killed ends up taking over, um, freeing the Egyptians from slavery. I mean, freeing the, the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. Um, remember, I said that the, the same type of irony happened with the Buddha. The dad tried to keep the Buddha from becoming a religious leader, and he ended up kind of facilitating this development in the Buddha. <clears throat> so these are stories. Um, historians actually don't think that there's much evidence that this happened. And interestingly, there, like with the Moses story, there's there's a lot of different cultures that have the same type of story, like Romulus and Remus. They they were, you know, set off on a river. There's uh, stories in Samaria where the same type of thing happened. A, a king was you know let loose on a river. This is it's a kind of you know different cultures have these these stories. They must have a, a metaphorical truth that's very important. Um, that's why all these uh, cultures have these stories. But anyways, back to Matthew. Um, or you can think that it's real if you want, and I don't, I don't mind if you do, if you think that that literally happened, that Moses was let out on a reed basket, and then the woman picked him up from the reed basket, and, you know, if you want to think that that actually happened, you can, that's fine. Um, it, you know, maybe it did, like I said, the, the physical nature of reality reflects the timeless reality. Well, these metaphors are, you know, pointing to the timeless truths. So it's possible that these myths, these metaphorical myths, actually did happen because the physical nature of reality, remember, does reflect this timeless reality. So if you want to think of it that way, okay, that's that's okay. So we have Matthew, the second quadrant one. So they're trying to emphasize uh, Jesus as, as Jewish. So another example is when they give Jesus' genealogy, they start off Jesus' genealogy with Abraham. Abraham was the father of the Jews, the first um, the first quote unquote Jew that there was the first one to believe that there was to say that there was one God. <clears throat> um, and the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the Jews. So he tries to emphasize that Jesus, you know, is a descendant of Abraham. That's how he does the genealogy. Uh, apparently the genealogy historians look at it and they say the genealogy is incorrect in a lot of ways. Um, there's, there's a lot of mistakes and, and they even go so far as to say that the author had to have known this. So they wonder, you know, why would the author, you know, have, who, who may, who may have, who probably knew this, why would he do that? It's an interesting question to ponder. Okay. So then we have Luke. Um, Luke is, uh, starts to see, so Luke is described as being written later and we start to see more anti-Jewish anti sentiment within Luke. And the reason why historians say that, that Luke um, 
has more anti-Jewish sentiment is because it was written later and historians argue that this was a time when Christians were starting, were more wanting to differentiate themselves from the Jews. So one way that they can do this is to try to make the Jews, you know, try to put down the Jews a little bit. This is what historians say. So, but um, in Luke, Jesus is not emphasized as being a Jew so much, but he's his, his, his connection to all of humanity is emphasized. So we have the, the second quadrant, you know, the Jewish family oriented. Um, interestingly, in Matthew 2, I forgot to mention, Jesus, Jesus says, um, I did not come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill it. And he describes that, you know, not only if, you know, it's, it's not that if, if you kill somebody, that's bad. But not only killing somebody is bad, but just thinking of killing somebody is bad. Not, he says, adultery is bad, but not just adultery is bad, but the thought of adultery is a sin. Um, so he's, he's, he's seen as legalistic, more legalistic in Matthew. Well, this makes sense. He's trying to, Matthew's, the historians say, is trying to emphasize Jesus' Jewishness. Well, Luke, he's not emphasizing the Jewishness so much. So, for instance, when they give the genealogy of Jesus in Luke, they say that they, they give the genealogy starting from Adam. Adam, the first man, the first human. Actually, tech, uh, Rabbis don't, like my rabbi doesn't think that Luke or that Adam was the first human. And there's a lot of evidence that indicates that Adam wasn't the first human. <clears throat> and, or or that, that, well, that the Bible is trying to say, not, is trying to say that Adam was not the first human. But that's for, that's a different story. <clears throat> but Luke is trying to emphasize Jesus's humanity, um, his connection to all of humanity, not just his uh, Jewishness. And then you get John, which people think is the most anti-Jewish. I I have a different thesis that kind of turns all this on its back. And I hopefully talk about that more later. But this is the way the historians look at these. And they say that John is the most anti-Jewish. Why? They Because it was written the latest and they said that this is when the... the Christians were really trying to differentiate themselves from the Jews. So this is why they would be um, anti-Jewish. Then you have the, the Gnostic Gospels. And then historians think that these were written a lot later. So examples would be Thomas. They say this is the fifth gospel. And then you have Peter, which they say was written a lot later. And the Gospel of, of Judas and other, other Gospels like this. One thing I want to say too is, Historians don't think that these were actually written by the people that they're cl claimed to be written by because they were they think that they were anonymous and that people filled in these names and they have they say a lot of evidence would indicate that <coughs> um, you know for instance Mark or Matthew did not actually write this but this is what historians say I'm I'm giving the historical analysis um, I'm not saying that I agree or disagree but this is what historians say now. The Gospel of Thomas is called the Gnostic Gospel, or is called the Gnostic Gospel. So what do the Gnostics believe? Gnostic means knowledge. Remember, the fourth quadrant of the fourth quadrant is knowledge. Well, the Gnostics say that our world, they're, they're, they're basically believe that the world is the Matrix. They would like the movie The Matrix because they say that our world is a prison and our bodies are a prison and the idea is we want to break free of this prison that we're in. Um, and there's a lot of quotes in the Gospel of Thomas that indicate this in, in these later Gnostic Gospels like Peter that indicate this idea. Another idea that the Gnostic Gospels talk about is they say that God is an imperfect God and that he made an imperfect universe, but they say that there is a higher order and they sometimes say that that is, you know, the Christ and, you know, stuff like this. But so they, they say that the act, the God, the creator God is an imperfect God. He's not a, he's not that great of a guy. This is what they say. Um, th this is why people think that the Gnostics are heretical, but the people who claim, who, who, who say what's heretical, they, they say what's heretical because they have a different viewpoint and they have the most power. So they get to say, okay, this, this group is heretical. But so let me give an example of a Gnostic teaching. 
So they say that, look at the Garden of Eden. They say that God actually was, was like a prison keeper uh, or, or, or a warden. And that the Garden of Eden was, you know, he was telling the, the Adam and Eve to stay in this garden to be content and be happy. Um, and he was trying to keep them ignorant and stupid and bliss. But he was, it, he was keeping them from knowledge, from the, the truth that they're actually living in a virtual reality, the matrix, and he's trying to keep them stupid. So what the Gnostics say is that Satan, or not Satan, but the devil or the serpent or whatever you want to call him, what they, what they call the devil, what Christians call the devil, and <clears throat> they say that the serpent, we'll call him the devil, was actually a good guy. The Gnostics say that the serpent gave this apple of knowledge. Remember? So this is the idea. God wanted them to be obedient. He wanted them to be second quadrant oriented. They want you to, to have belief, faith, behavior, and belonging. He wanted them to just be happy, be content in the garden. But then the devil said, you know what? Guys, you're in an, you're, you're, you're being, you're being trapped in this fake world. There's knowledge. There's truth outside of this. You can break out of this place. I will give you that. And he gives them the apple. Or not, it actually wasn't an apple. It was just a fruit. My, uh, my rabbi thinks that it was uh, probably grapes. And he thinks that it was probably wine that they drank. And a lot of rabbis, a lot of people think that really it was metaphorical um, when they ate the fruit of them having sex. And remember I said that knowing is equivalent to sex in the Bible. So biting out a tree of knowledge is equivalent to sex. And, you know, it says when you're being fruitful, that means that you're having a lot of children. That means you're having a lot of sex. So biting out of the, the fruit was, you know, was, was sex. Um, stuff gets even deeper, but the idea was the devil actually freed them from this slavery and from this God's prison that they think was a um, imperfect God. And then they say, well, there's a lot of evidence that this God was imperfect. And they say, like, look at the story of Noah. Um, the story of Noah kind of represents the death and resurrection. You know, there's the death of all the people, but at the same time, everything comes back the same way. You know, the two animals of each kind. But so that, but that what they say is that, you know, God made a mistake. He realized he's an imperfect God and then he had to destroy it and bring it back. So they say, see, the God is, is not a perfect God. He's, 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 he's fallible. So this is Gnostic teaching. Gnostic means knowledge. Um, the Gospel of Peter. All right, I think well, I'll, I'll say in the, well, in the Gospel of Peter, it says that Peter says that Jesus, I think it was the Gospel of Peter, he says that Jesus was the Christ, but he was not the Messiah. It's funny because those the two things mean the same thing, but... You see, there's, there's these strange teachings in the Gnostic Gospels that people don't understand. <clears throat> in the Gospel of Judas, Judas is seen as the good guy. Um, and Jesus, t uh, he's, he's actually Jesus' favorite disciple. And actually, I even think that if you read the, the first Gospels, there is evidence that Judas isn't that bad of a guy. And actually, that Jesus like, that, that actually Judas is kind of a good guy. But there's, there would be arguments against that. But I, I could explain but so Jesus says uh, to Judas in, the, in this gospel, he gives Judas secret knowledge. And he says that, and he tells Judas, you know, the, the, the secrets and that he had, Judas doesn't actually want Jesus to, go, Jesus to go on the cross. But Jesus tells Judas, you have to do this because we have to fulfill this. And Judas is like, fine, I'll do it for you. I, I will, you know. I will betray you, quote unquote, but actually Jesus wants him to do it. Um, now, an, a Gnostic teaching with the gospel of Judas is Jesus walks in and there's all the, his disciples are all, they're, you know, they're all Jews. So they're all praying to God and Jesus, Jesus starts to laugh. And then they're all looking at Jesus and they're like, you know, we're praying and you're laughing. What's the big deal? You know, this, that's so disrespectful. And the Gnostic teaching is that Jesus was laughing because he sees them praying to this imperfect God, this God who created this matrix that is a prison. And he's thinking, this God is, is not worth praying to. 
This is the Gnostic teaching. And then he, and then he goes to tell Judas his secret teachings. It tells Judas some sec the secrets about the kingdom of heaven. Um, so this is a, so you see the Gnostic Gospels are, are a lot different than the first four Gospels. Um, and the Gnostics were kind of stamped out because, you know, they were seen as heretical. <clears throat> One thing I want to mention, too, is that there were four groups of four dominant philosophies at the time of when, you know, Jesus was doing his ministry according to historians, is what historians think. So they say, and this is from Josephus and from the Gospels, there's the Sadducees. The Sadducees uh, didn't really believe in the resurrection, literal re resurrection of the dead, but they thought that um, there would be a, a kingdom of God. And they apparently Jesus got the Sadducees upset when he said that the temple would be destroyed. And that's when the Sadducees started to say, hey, you know, maybe we should uh, send this guy over to, um, to the Romans because he's talking about destroying the temple and, and we don't like that. So the Sadducees, there's the Pharisees and the Pharisees are the conser more conservative group. They believe that you should follow the law completely and, you know, literally. And they're the conservative group, the second quadrant. Then there's the Essenes who say, you know, they kind of break away from the other groups and they say they want to live on their own. They live uh, kind of communistic. They don't have any property, but they live on their own and they do their own type of thing. They're the individuals, the third quadrant. And then Josephus says that there's a fourth philosophy and it kind of has aspects of all these, but it's also different. So these were the philosophies at the time. Uh, same thing with the Greeks. The Greeks had four philosophies. They had the, I, I forget what they are exactly right now, but I think it's Stoics, the Stoics, the Cynics, and then there were two more. I can't remember the names now. Um, the Hedonists, and Stoics. Okay, and there was a fourth one. But it's the same type of thing. Um, so, I just gave you some of the way that historians look at the Gospels. Hopefully next, <coughs> I can get into um, other ideas. <coughs> so, okay, I'm going to stop now and then hopefully start again a little bit. But we see the quadrant in all this.